Hey, my fellow geothermal students, topic 14. Oh, man, cold fusion's happening. A uh, couple things there. I want to make sure that you guys have got a couple of really good papers in, but uh, don't miss out on the, on the pointage on those papers. So submit your paper up there in the uh, submission link, and there have been some comments about the submission link not functioning properly, but uh, I'm getting them, so go right ahead and proceed. Just, uh, once you just you get five submissions, so you know, stick me a, a copy, and then I'll uh, make some comments if you need to make some improvements. But uh, a couple of really good papers have come in. I'm looking forward to reading the rest of them. And cold fusion, whoa! But let's not miss out on uh, the final exam that's coming up here. Got a final exam coming up. And that's going to be uh, open to you right here. You can see the our the introduction here. When you click here to launch the final exam, and then uh, away you go. So it's not open yet, but I'll open that up for you here real soon. And don't want to miss out on that. That's the final exam is some good points for you. And you'll notice here also that we've got a, a quiz in uh, chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8 in uh, Smart Geothermal, a Guide to Geothermal. So that quiz opened uh, Tuesday, and I'd like to go ahead and get you guys going on that. Then with the final exam and this final quiz, you get your papers. I've got all the median temperature labs. <laughs> You guys are going to get a good grade in this course. You're doing great, you guys. I understand. I know exactly what we need. <laughs> Now I'm ready to perform the perfect cold fusion reaction. Uh, doctor, don't get too close to the reactor, doctor. <laughs> oh. Wow, wow. wow, man. I sure, sure feel weird. I think it was that cold fusion. Yeah, man. It's wild, that stuff. Kind of makes a guy feel like a uh, fly in a way. <laughs> Whoa, man. I think I should have stayed a, a, a little further. A little further away, away, maybe a little further away from the reactor. <laughs> so guys, what we want to remember now is that the, the mantle, the core mantle interface, you know, the core of the earth and that plasma interface that's created between the counter rotation of the, of the core of the earth to the mantle of the earth, the essence of the ultimate geothermal energy is a, a source of what we might call cold fusion in, at the, the heart of our own planet. But uh, how does it work? This is a Ninety-nine percent of the visible matter in the known universe is in an extraordinary state. This state puzzled physicists for a long time. But scientists wanted to understand it. They were hoping they could access an almost inexhaustible source of energy. They wanted to bring the cosmic energy of the stars, the force of our sun, to Earth. 
our sun has been shining for 4.6 billion years. A glowing ball made of hydrogen and helium. The star's power plant is located in its interior. Here, temperatures of 15 million degrees prevail. The hydrogen atoms are composed of nuclei and electrons. This state of matter is called plasma. Hydrogen nuclei fuse with one another. Helium nuclei are produced and a great deal of energy. But 15 million degrees. But are the particles really fast enough? They have too little energy to be able to fuse in sufficient numbers. That's right. But in the sun's core, enormous pressure prevails, ensuring that fusion reactions take place. But exerting such a high pressure here on Earth will never work. That's right, too. And that's why scientists had to resort to a somewhat different reaction and, above all, produce much higher temperatures for fusion. Over 100 million degrees. Heating the plasma was not the problem. The real difficulty was to maintain plasma temperature in the chamber. For if plasma comes into contact with the chamber wall, it immediately cools down again. So, scientists just start to levitate hot plasma of a hundred million degrees in a burn chamber without it touching the walls? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> You're laughing, but this is precisely what scientists had to try. And they used a force that you all know. Magnetism. Magnetism. Yes. We <laughs> Plasma consists of positively charged atomic nuclei and negatively charged electrons. Therefore, it can be influenced by electric and magnetic fields. Just like this pen. And it can even be confined in magnetic field cages. And then in such a way that it does not touch the wall of a fusion chamber. Can't I shape the plasma any way I want, just by generating the appropriate magnetic field? <laughs> Unfortunately not. The particles mustn't be allowed to escape at the poles of the magnetic field. Only ring-shaped plasmas can do this. Furthermore, the magnetic fields have to be specially shaped to insulate the heat of the plasma. So get ready because next week we're going to have a bonus lecture on toroidal implosion uh, confinement technologies, which are the source of the implosion magneto uh, fusion reaction that's driving the uh, new engine that's getting us to Mars. To achieve this, one has to understand the plasma very well. Work for more than 50 years. Since the end of the 1940s, scientists in many countries have been trying to clarify the properties of plasma. However, good experimental results were rare. It was not till the end of the 60s that Russian scientists announced astonishing successes with their so-called tokamak device. Worldwide tokamak fever erupted, but after 10 years, the best results were still a factor of 25,000 below the requirements of a fusion power plant. But then the large joint European experiment, JET, went into operation in the United Kingdom. In 1997, the scientists there obtained results just a factor of six short of the ignition conditions of a plasma. The sun's fire came within reach for the first time. The beginning of the 21st century, it was still not clear if a fusion power plant was possible. But continual increase of oil and gas prices brought the threat of economic crisis and war. And it was also clear that our climate didn't need even more greenhouse gases. The time for new sources of energy was more than ripe. Exactly. For fusion, everything now depended on one project that was mainly made possible by European research, the international experiment ITER. In 2007, in Cadarache in southern France, construction of the largest experiment in the history of fusion research began. Besides Europe, Russia, Japan and the USA, the project also included China, 
India and South Korea. The test reactor aimed at demonstrating that it is physically and technically possible to gain energy from fusion. In ITER, the essential fusion power plant technologies were deployed for the first time. 800 cubic meters of burning plasma was to generate 500 megawatts of power, about 10 times as much as was needed to heat the plasma. But what I don't understand is how the energy in a power plant is extracted from the burning plasma. How do you actually extract electricity from the fusion energy released? The raw materials for fusion are available on Earth in almost inexhaustible quantities. And in one gram of fuel, there's the combustion energy of 11 tons of coal. The fusing of the two hydrogen isotopes, deuterium and tritium, creates a helium nucleus and a neutron. 80% of the fusion energy is in the neutrons. They are not charged and therefore fly out of the magnetic field cage. They are slowed down in the walls of the plasma vessel. Thermal energy is produced and it can be converted to electric energy, just as in the old coal-fueled power plants. The energy of 11,000 kilograms of coal in one gram of fusion fuel. That sounds really tremendous. But the plasma is very thin. One gram of fuel is diffused in over 1,000 cubic meters of burn chamber volume. Furthermore, the plasma can only be maintained under very specific conditions. Any perturbance, however small, terminates the fusion reaction. A runaway effect is thus not possible. Okay, time for a little test. You have exactly 30 minutes to research the end of the story. I want a complete dossier. What did we learn from ITER? When did we get the first fusion power plants? And how much fusion energy are we annually consuming today in Europe? In the next physics lesson, we will discuss about the possibilities of beaming. Whoa, the ultimate online lesson. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> So now, how about cold fusion? Let's remember we're uh, dealing with the plasma element, which you know is the essence of the, the plasma we see on the sun. You know, four states of energy, huh? Plasma being one of those. Let's see how cold fusion works. This is the good stuff right here. A voltage is applied to two electrodes immersed in an electrolytic solution of heavy water and lithium salts. This establishes a flow of current from a strip of palladium acting as the cathode to several platinum coils acting as the anode. Temperature sensors measure the temperature of the electrolyte solution within the cell as well as the cooling water that surrounds it in the larger jacket container. Within the solution Many of the D2O heavy water molecules are dissociated into OD negative and D positive ions. When the voltage is applied to the electrodes, the OD negative ions are attracted to the positively charged platinum anodes, where they lose an electron and combine with other OD ions to reform back into D2O, while the remaining orphaned oxygen atoms combine to form O2, which escapes as a gas up to the surface of the solution. Meanwhile, the D-positive ions are attracted to the negative... Oh, all right, here we go, guys. Uh, had a little glitch there. Let's see if we can continue this now on this uh, nested cold fusion reaction. A significant amount of heat is released in this fusion process. The energy released by each helium atom that appears 24 million electron volts is dissipated by the lattice as heat. 
raising the temperature of the palladium electrode and the surrounding electrolytic solution. The amount of energy being generated by this fusion reaction is five million times greater than if those same two deuterium atoms were chemically combined to form a single D2 deuterium molecule and 10 million times larger than the oxidation reaction to create a D2O heavy water molecule. It is this excess heat that is causing such excitement within the scientific community. Yeah. Yeeha. On March 23rd, 1989, two chemists stunned the world when they announced that they had achieved cold fusion in a laboratory. Martin Fleischmann, one of Britain's leading electrochemists, and his colleague Stanley Pons, then chairman of the University of Utah's chemistry department, reported that they were able to create a nuclear reaction at room temperature in a test tube. Since then, cold fusion has been replicated in hundreds of experiments, in dozens of major laboratories, all reporting similar results under similar conditions. But what is cold fusion? And how do we know it is real? Cold fusion is a nuclear reaction that generates heat without burning chemical fuel. Cold fusion has reached temperatures and power density roughly as high as the core of a nuclear fission power reactor. Unlike most other nuclear reactions, it does not produce dangerous penetrating radiation because it consumes hydrogen in a nuclear process rather than a chemical process. The hydrogen generates millions of times more energy than the best chemical fuels such as gasoline and paraffin. Hydrogen fuel is virtually free and cold fusion devices are small, relatively simple and inexpensive. They are self-contained, about the size, shape, and cost of a NICAD battery. They are nothing like gigantic nuclear power reactors, so the cost of the energy with cold fusion would be low. If researchers can learn to control cold fusion and make it occur on demand, it might become a practical source of energy, providing inexhaustible energy for billions of years. It would also eliminate the threat of global warming because it does not produce carbon dioxide. Most cold fusion reactors produce low heat, less than a watt, but a few have been much hotter. Here are 124 tests from various laboratories, grouped from high power to low. Only a few produced high power. Most produce less than 20 watts. In 1996, at Toyota's IMRA Research Lab in Europe, a series of reactors produced 30 to 100 watts, which was easy to detect. They continued to produce heat for weeks, far longer than any chemical device could. The core of the Toyota reactor was about the size of a birthday cake candle. A candle burning at 100 watts uses up all of the fuel in seven minutes, whereas one of the Toyota devices ran at 100 watts continuously for 30 days. That's thousands of times longer than the candle. It produced thousands of times more energy than the best chemical fuel. So, if the tests were so promising and were able to achieve such high power density and run so long, why hasn't cold fusion become a practical source of energy? Because cold fusion reactions can only be replicated under rare conditions that are difficult to achieve, even for experts. It's like making a souffle. If you forget to put the egg whites in the souffle, even if you set the right temperature and do everything else correctly, you get no souffle. But when the right conditions are achieved, the reaction always turns on. SRI International and the Italian Agency for New Technology were able to get all of the critical factors just right and achieve the cold fusion reaction in several tests. It is not difficult for an expert to reach a ratio of hydrogen atoms to palladium atoms of about 60%. This takes a few days, but it isn't high enough to trigger a cold fusion effect. You have to go higher, and the higher you go, the harder it gets. But with the right kind of metal and good techniques, the amount of hydrogen in the metal gradually rises. When it reaches 90 atoms and other conditions are met, bingo, the cold fusion reaction turns on. So 
here's where we uh, nanotechnology has created these um, nano grids that have allowed the cold fusion to actually become viable to produce more energy than it consumes in the reaction and the guys down in LA are doing that right now uh, La La Land Los Angeles this graph shows an exponential increase in power when the ratio of hydrogen atoms to palladium atoms exceeded 90 percent a Toyota lab also saw the exponential increase above 90 percent hundreds of other researchers have seen the same effect Another factor that makes the cold fusion effect turn on is electrical current density. The higher it gets, the more intense the cold fusion reaction becomes. When there is a reaction, that is. If there is no reaction in the first place, because, for example, the ratio of hydrogen to palladium doesn't get above 90%, raising the current does no good. We've learned a lot since the Fleischmann and Pons announcement in 1989, and we know what now must be done. But knowing how to do something doesn't make it easy. We have to learn more. With enough research, scientists may learn to control cold fusion and make it safe, reliable, and cost-effective. But it's going to take thousands of hours of research and millions of dollars of high-precision equipment. Basic research is expensive. However, if this pans out, it will reduce the cost of energy worldwide to practically zero, saving several billion dollars per day. This might happen as quickly as microcomputers replaced mainframe computers, or the speed at which the internet expanded after 1990. It can happen quickly because it requires no distribution infrastructure and it calls for only a few changes to most core technology. In other words, a cold fusion powered car would not need a gas station because you could run it for a year with a spoonful of fuel, costing a few cents. But that is information for another video, another day. To learn more about the potentially groundbreaking research surrounding cold fusion, please visit lenr.org. Thank you. Sweet, huh? Very nice. So let's take a look at uh, an actual uh, experiment by J.L. Nodden. See how simple the reactor itself is. Here's your plasma element, and you get to that palladium saturation. Then you get the disassociation or the reaction in, in the fusion diffusion of hydrogen. Of course, we get into the turbines or the mechanism that actually would drive the wheels of the car, for, in, for instance, or generator or whatever. You know, the heat is just going to provide the, the uh, energy to drive turbines or some type of uh, me mechanical entity that would then power the wheels of your car or turn the shaft on your generator create electricity. But uh, this ex particular experiment requires more energy than it produces. So but there's actually some headway that where they're with super lasers that uh, they're getting a, a self uh, perpetuating f uh, cold fusion reaction that consumes less energy than is required to, or that produces more energy than is required to start the reaction and maintain the reaction. So there's your plasma element that we saw between the core of the earth and the mantle of the earth. So we have a plasma element. This is how we're going to start using it. Very cool.